Tonight, breaking news, the new tornado strike as millions of Americans are on alert for severe weather. A large and dangerous twister, you see it there, touching down in northern Michigan. Early reports saying the damage is extensive and flooding, hitting the Miami area. As raging wildfires tear across New Mexico, and this weekend, the east bracing for dangerous heat, temperatures could soar up to 30 degrees above average. Also breaking tonight, Biden's immigration setback, a judge blocking the White House plan to lift Title 42, which would have scrapped a COVID-19 border restriction for asylum seekers entering the U.S. Sam Brock joins Top Story live from the southern border with the reaction from the White House. Market shockwave U.S. stocks briefly pushed into a bear market today after the S&P dropped 20 percent from its all-time high in January. What it could mean for your money. Monkeypox spreading one possible case still under investigation in New York City with the main is now doing as the World Health Organization confirms at least 80 cases of the rare virus across 11 countries. The warning from the Global Health Agency on what to expect over the coming days. Pulled from the flames, body cam footage capturing a sheriff's deputy in Florida rushing to save a little boy trapped inside a burning home. How he used his flashlight to help get the boy out alive. And leaving SNL? Pete Davidson, Kate McKinnon, and other big names reportedly stepping away from the show. What we're learning about their next projects. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. Right now we are tracking a tornado strike. Severe weather sweeping across the country as we come on the air. The new image is just coming in showing a large tornado touching down in northern Michigan. We are hearing about several injuries, including hospitalizations, and we're seeing images of widespread damage to homes and businesses in the area. And down south, heavy rain also drenching downtown Miami, widespread flooding, snarling traffic, and causing a headache for commuters. And new video shot from an airplane shows a raging wildfire in New Mexico. Several fires there have burned for more than 400,000 acres across the street. And more than 25 million Americans are under alert for dangerous heat this weekend. So let's get right to Bill Karens, who joins us now live in the studio here in Top Story. And Bill, you were just telling me this seems like a very strong tornado. Yeah, and when you see the pictures of cars, that are tossed, when you see homes that have just been destroyed, businesses, the roofs, even brick structures crumbled, you know you're talking about a strong higher-end tornado, not a weak one, and it's no surprise that we do have injuries. Search and rescue is still continuing at this hour. There are still people missing, so you know it wouldn't surprise anyone with a tornado this strong going through a town, a population center, if we do unfortunately end up with fatalities. We hope not, and we'll find out in the hours to come as first responders from all over northern Michigan are rushing to this area. So here's where Gaylord is located. And this was not a tornado outbreak. This was one supercell thunderstorm that started around Traverse City, went over Gaylord, and then exited here just south of Rogers City. This was it. This was only the big, powerful storm in the area. But again, it was strong enough to produce that really strong tornado, and this time it just happened to hit a populated area. We've also been tracking severe storms from Pennsylvania through New Jersey today. This area was under a tornado watch. We had some really big hail just east of, Pen of Philadelphia, but that threat is now ending as it's just a rain storm now from New York City out to Long Island. So what is in store this weekend? Severe weather. Remember, May is our number one tornado month. We have 36 million people at risk. The slight risk goes all the way from central Texas to northern New England. Isolated tornadoes are possible. Hail, damaging winds. And then we're going to end the weekend with a severe weather threat in northern portions of the northeast, especially from the Capital District northwards with 5 million people at risk. So, you know, a, a little bit of everything. But that one tornado changed so many lives in just a short period. Yeah, and I'm sure we're going to get more reports reports throughout the broadcast. I do want to ask you about the heat in the east because I know you and your team are watching this. I mean, this is late July. I mean, late July, you're like, it's a heat wave. But this is the first significant heat of the season for the northeast. Now, everyone in the south has been suffering all week long. It's hot, it's humid, and that warm air is blowing northwards this weekend. And a lot of people haven't even turned their air conditioners on yet in the northeast. You're going to need it full blast. So fingers crossed it works and everything is functioning properly. 50 cities across 21 states are going to be under sea 
record highs that are predicted. We have 25 million people at least that are in heat advisories. And how hot will it get? Boston, we should break record highs Saturday and Sunday, mid 90s. DC, 97 on Saturday, New York City, 92. And I'll leave you with this Philadelphia, the hottest temperature you've ever recorded in the month of May is 97 degrees. We're predicting to tie that tomorrow with the possibility of beating it. And remember, these temperatures are in the shade. If you're right. in the sun, it's that much worse. Yes, yeah, scorching weekend. Okay, Bill, we appreciate all that. We're also following other breaking news tonight. A federal judge blocking the Biden administration from lifting Title 42. A COVID-19 public health policy limiting asylum seekers from entering the country. The decision coming after weeks of bipartisan criticism and concerns that the end of the health order would lead to a surge in migrants. Sam Brock is at the southern border tonight. Tonight, a major legal blow to the Biden administration at the border, where the desperate scenes are virtually nonstop. We met this couple from Ecuador, emotional and clutching one another as they crossed into the U.S. ¿Qué son los sentimientos que están en su cabeza ahora? We asked how they're feeling. I'm nervous, this father says. I can't believe I put my family in danger. As this mother from Colombia, who left her two kids at home, fights tears. Pleading with President Biden, give us an opportunity. We want a better future for our families, she says. Now, a federal judge barring the Biden administration from lifting a COVID-era border restriction known as Title 42, as the administration had planned. Two dozen Republican state attorneys general had sued to stop them. The federal judge ruling ending Title 42 would cause immediate and irreparable harm, saying it could result in a threefold increase in border crossings. It comes as the Biden administration faces bipartisan criticism over its border policy. Last year, there were an all-time record 1.7 million illegal border crossings. And just last month, 234,000 migrants crossed into the U.S., the highest monthly total ever recorded. Even with Title 42 in place, a majority of those migrants were released into the U.S. We were not prepared for the immigration problem. The sheriff the here in Maverick concern. County tells us they don't have the resources to handle the already soaring numbers. Are you losing sleep over this? I'm worried, very worried, yes, very worried. I, I wish, uh, you know, that they could hold back on the Title 42, maybe another three or four months. Maybe we can be a little more prepared. All right, it looks like that's going to happen right now. Sam Brock joins us now live here on Top Story from Eagle Pass, the border just behind him. Sam, as you mentioned, the CDC had planned to stop authorizing Title 42 this upcoming Monday. With this injunction today, do we know how long Title 42 will remain in place when clearly there is a massive surge at the border now? Incredible surge in time. It could be a matter of weeks. It could be a matter of months. The big question was whether or not the Biden administration would be appealing this decision. There was some conjecture over that, but we just found minutes ago, yes, they disagree with the decision, and yes, they are going to be appealing it. And moreover, that White House releases the Department of Homeland Security is going to be acting as if Title 42 will be lifted, which, Tom, is a bit ironic because NBC News has procured documentation that shows the DHS believed they were somewhere in the range of $1.2 billion to $2 billion short of being able to manage this escalating crisis. Tom? Sam Brock with some new reporting tonight on this breaking story for us. Sam, we thank you for that. All right, we turn now to the state of the economy after another volatile day on Wall Street. The Dow Jones Industrial Average climbing into positive territory after heavy selling during the day and the broader S&P 500 index briefly entering bear market territory when it was down 20% from its all-time high earlier this year. NBC's Tom Costello reports. Facing the growing possibility of a recession, Wall Street spent another day in turmoil. The body blow this market keeps taking and when it might end. The broad S&P climbed back after heavy selling, but it's still down 18% year to date. The Dow was down 600 points, then rallied, but still lost ground for eight consecutive weeks. The first time that's happened since 1923. Among the inflation sensitive retailers getting hit hard year to date, Dollar General, Target, Home Depot, and Ross. From housing to groceries to gasoline to airfares, hotels, and restaurants, inflation is forcing families to make tough choices. I have three kids and see what I'm going to do with them for recreation because everything is crazy expensive. To tame inflation, the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates, but going too fast could push the economy into recession. Now, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is warning there's a real risk of something even more concerning, stagflation. Higher food and energy prices 
are having stagflationary effects, namely depressing output and spending and raising inflation. Stagflation is a stagnant economy, while unemployment and consumer prices continue to rise, something the U.S. last saw in the 70s and early 80s. Consumer prices were up again last month. While unemployment is now near a 50-year low, experts are concerned. There's a real risk we could have uh, a problem with stagflation in, in the months ahead, in the years ahead, as the Fed begins to try to slow this economy, but inflation remains high. Like nearly every city in America, Denver is struggling with skyrocketing inflation. Rents have jumped 20, 40, even 50 percent and more. Our NBC station 9 News met Gabby Reese, whose landlord just raised the rent from $1,600 a month to $2,500, up 56 percent. Just a feeling of panic because, I mean, the money just doesn't exist. With family budgets under extreme pressure, concern that the economy is in jeopardy. The stock market slide is concerning to anyone who has money in the market. The S&P down 18 percent from its all-time high, but it's now sitting where it was in February of last year. Experts predict the market's recovery will depend on whether a recession, in fact, materializes and how long it lasts. Tom? And that's the big question right now. Tom Costello, we thank you for that. For more on the markets and what it could mean for your money, I want to bring in our friend CNBC contributor Ron Insana. So, Ron, a lot of people right now are predicting the sky is falling. Help us get a better understanding of what's happening because we've had you on in the past over the past few weeks. You haven't been as pessimistic as others, but talk to us on where you see the country heading. Are we headed for a recession? Well, that's possible, Tom. And, and, and the sky's not falling. The stock market's falling. I mean, I think we need to dis make a distinguishment between the two. Um, we've had bear markets in the past. This, by the way, is a bear market. It's really a semantic game as to whether or not uh, the S&P closes 20 percent below its all-time high. When you look at the average stock down between 27 and 30 percent, 50 percent of the NASDAQ stocks are down 50 percent, 25 percent of them are down 70 percent or more. And that's where a lot of the investing has been taking place over the last several years. So, look, a recession is a risk because the Federal Reserve is, is currently hell-bent on beating back inflation, even at the cost of a slowing economy and an increase in unemployment. But, again, the comparison to the 1980s is very rough. You saw that um, clip from John Chancellor, and, and the monthly reading on inflation that was in the graphic was 18.2 percent. We're at 8 percent right now. The unemployment rate's at 3.6 percent. So, yes, we may have a recession. Yes, we're in a bear market. Yes, the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates, and there are a variety of other geopolitical issues going on right now. Uh, but it's this isn't the end of the world. It is very tough on middle-income and lower-income families with prices going up as fast as they are. Ron, what are you watching? You know, we, we get so much financial data, and everyone's sort of looking through it and pouring through this data. You, you look at consumer spending. It, it's still not bad, but prices are right. through the roof. The thing that I noticed this week that I felt was new was these, was these big companies that are slowing down their hiring or doing hiring freezes or layoffs altogether. Right. And then we're seeing that because their costs are going up. And so rather than fill open positions, and remember, there are almost two open positions in the U.S. for every unemployed worker in the United States. So either they're not going to hire, or in some cases, even Amazon, the, the, one of the largest retailers, certainly online, is, is planning layoffs because they overhired, they have bloated inventories, uh, because they may have, in this environment, you know, picked some of the wrong items to have in stock. Consumers are changing their behavior right now because of the cost increases we're seeing. They're buying more of the basic necessities like you see here and foregoing uh, expenses on, let's say, consumer electronics and some other things that were previously uh, purchased during the pandemic. So, look, it, it, it's a rough environment. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Uh, as far as the stock market is concerned, in the 38 years that I've been doing this, you know, there have been quite a number of bear markets. There have been several recessions. This isn't anything like the great financial crisis of 2008, where the banking system is at risk and the economy or the global economy is in danger of falling off a cliff. It is, though, a difficult time to be sure. All right, Ron and Sana, we thank you for your analysis on a day like this. All right, moving on to some other breaking news that's just come into our newsroom on that monkeypox outbreak. Health officials in New York City have now confirmed tonight a case of the rare virus in a patient who is in isolation at the hospital. However, it still needs to be sent to the CDC for full confirmation, and it comes as the World Health Organization reports cases of monkeypox in at least 11 countries. Gabe Gutierrez has more. 
Tonight, a potential case of monkeypox is being investigated at this New York City hospital after the U.S.'s first case of the year was confirmed Wednesday in Massachusetts, a man who'd only recently traveled to Canada. This was really uh, unusual because the patient had no travel history, uh, no uh, exposure to animals that would be known to be reservoirs. Monkeypox is a rare but potentially serious viral illness that's usually found in West and Central Africa. But what's strange this time, researchers say, is that it's spreading in Western countries. The World Health Organization meeting today to discuss the outbreak has already deployed an incident response team in the UK. Germany, France, Spain, Canada, and even Australia are among other countries also investigating cases. At least three cases have been linked to a festival in Belgium. We've never seen cases of monkeypox occur all over the globe at the same time. Monkeypox was discovered in monkeys in 1958. More than a decade later in Africa, it spread to humans. In 2003, there were at least 47 confirmed or probable cases in the U.S. across six states, all associated with prairie dogs. Symptoms include fever, fatigue, and rashes. Researchers are looking into why clusters of cases have been identified among gay or bisexual men. The likelihood of further spread of the virus through close contact, for example, through sexual activities, is considered to be high. But the likelihood of transmission between individuals without close contact is considered to be low. All right, that was Gabe Gutierrez for us. Dr. Amesh Adalja is an infectious disease specialist and a senior scholar at Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. We want to talk to him about monkeypox because we know you have a lot of questions. So first, Dr. Adalja, take us into that hospital room at Bellevue Hospital here in New York City. What's happening right now with that confirmed case? Primarily what's happening is the patient is being kept in isolation. We usually use airborne isolation for patients with monkeypox to prevent spread to other patients and or to healthcare providers. Healthcare providers are using personal protective equipment. Most cases do well on their own without any specific treatment. So it's a lot of supportive care, making sure they're hydrated, making sure their pain is controlled, their fear is controlled and monitoring of routine laboratory values and vital signs. So there's not much excitement in terms of things that you do to the patient. There are some experimental antivirals that are used for smallpox or that are approved for smallpox, but it's unlikely that they're being used unless this case is severely ill. So these cases are showing up in places where we don't typically see monkeypox. That's why it's making the news like the UK and right now in the US. Do we know why? It's a little bit unclear, and this is the most pressing challenge, is to try to understand the epidemiology. When we see monkeypox cases in the United States or in Europe or wherever they are, they're usually uh, attached to some kind of travel to an endemic country in Africa or some exposure to animals that might have been infected with the virus. What we're seeing now is person-to-person -person transmission. And at least from early reports, what we're seeing is that there is a clustering in gay and bisexual men. And that may be playing a role, that the close contact that might be occurring in those social networks may be affording the virus an opportunity to spread in a way that it hasn't been able to do before. We know how to handle monkeypox. We know how to stop it. The key thing right now is the epidemiology, the contact tracing, and deploying things like the smallpox vaccine, which have been shown to be effective at blocking and stopping these types of outbreaks. There's been a lot of confusion about how you catch monkeypox. Can you explain in the simplest of terms how it's transmitted and put into perspective how contagious it is or isn't? Monkeypox is transmitted through close contact, usually skin-to-skin -skin contact. Also, respiratory droplets can spread it, uh, contaminated items or clothing, as well as animal exposure. It's not very contagious when you compare it to, for example, a respiratory virus like SARS-CoV-2 or like influenza. It really requires close contact. And in the past, in, in 2021, we had two cases imported to the U.S., one of whom took commercial flights and had no transmission on that commercial flight. So it's not that type of a virus. And I know people kind of have a tendency to view every Everything through the, the lens of COVID, that doesn't apply to monkeypox. It's a different type of virus, different transmission characteristics, different tools. So I think that we have to kind of avoid people trying to, to kind of think about this in the same uh, in the same breath as COVID-19. But doctor, but it's totally so it, it's, I get that and I understand. I, I'm glad for you making that point. But if it's not so contagious, why does it seem like it's spreading so fast at this moment? 
this is the big question, and I think it has to do with close contact occurring in those social networks. In the past, we haven't seen monkeypox spread because they've usually been travel-related cases. What appears to happen happen now is a travel-related case has gotten into a, a network, a, a close network of people who have close contact with each other. We, we're hearing about cases linked to a sauna in Spain and other types of issues where, where there may be close sexual contact. Not that this is spreading sexually, but the close contact that happens in those networks may be facilitating the spread. And many of the cases have been misdiagnosed as sexually transmitted diseases, which also could have led to more spread than would usually happen. Usually this is a travel medicine issue, not something that ends up in sexually transmitted infection clinics. Okay, so finally and briefly, if you could just give us once again the symptoms so people in case they think they, they've been exposed, what should they look out for? The biggest symptoms are fever and rash, and the rash is very characteristic. It will it will start kind of in the central part of your body and then spread to your, to your arms and legs. Also associated with lymph node swelling, so it's the fever and rash are the real clear thing to, to look for. And this isn't a general threat to the public, but if you're somebody who thinks they might have been exposed, that's what you should be looking for. Okay, doctor, we always appreciate your time. Thank you for clearing so many of our questions up. We're returning now to another major health concern, desperation growing tonight for millions of families still trying to get their hands on baby formula. As the shortage becomes even more critical, the first shipment from overseas is expected this weekend. Jolene Kent has the latest. The baby formula shortage is getting worse. New data shows the national out-of-stock average rose to 45% last week. That's the highest level yet. You have a full cart. Look at this. Look at all this. I need to Look at the baby. shelves. This video posted to TikTok illustrating just part of the problem, appearing to show one person at a Target store stocking up. You don't think I need it for my baby too? According to the White House, the first flight bringing formula to the U.S. from abroad is expected to leave Europe for Plainfield, Indiana this weekend. Landing in the U.S. soon will be the equivalent of one and a half million eight ounce bottles of three types of formula from manufacturer Nestle. These three were prioritized because they serve a critical medical purpose, as they are for babies with cow's milk protein allergies. Once in the U.S., the formula will be distributed nationwide by a third party contracted by the Department of Health and Human Services. This, as more babies with sensitivities are admitted to the hospital, five for formula issues at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. This is an unprecedented time. I think we've really taken for granted that we've had a pipeline of safe formula to feed infants and children for a long time. So we're doing the best we can. Four-month-old Samuel Payton in Texas has struggled tolerating certain brands. His spittle was curdled and he began screaming. His hair was falling out on the side and we noticed some rashes. He had been on Abbott formulas that were recalled back in February. Since then, his moms, Davina and Diana, have turned to a donor milk bank as a stopgap measure. But with donations limited, they got clearance from their pediatrician to start him on solids two months earlier than planned. We're trying to get him weaned off of this formula because we don't know what it's going to happen. One of millions of families hoping that flight from Europe is ready for takeoff. Jolene Kent, NBC News, Austin, Texas. Okay, we head overseas now to Ukraine, where hundreds of the last defenders of Mariupol have surrendered to Russian troops as the city falls. And now we're getting a look at some incredible footage filmed by a volunteer paramedic in Mariupol. She's been hailed as a Ukrainian national hero. Cal Perry brings us her story and a warning. Some of this footage is graphic and may be disturbing. Another night in Mariupol and another mangled body on a stretcher. These are the victims of Russian bombardment brought in by paramedics and the army fighting to save lives in a city under siege. Yulia Payevska, nicknamed Tyra, is one of those medics. And this is a look into her daily life. One, two, three, up. Captured by a camera she strapped to her head, Tyra and her team of paramedics, nicknamed Tyra's Angels, based in Mariupol, tending to the city's wounded. Payevska, a star athlete and military veteran who competed in the Invictus Games, was hailed as a national hero back in Ukraine. But on March the 16th, she was captured by Russian soldiers and disappeared along with her driver, Serhi. Miraculously, just days before, she managed to hand hundreds of gigabytes of footage to the last Associated Press journalist leaving the city. She gave instructions via a walkie-talkie. 
On the flash drive that has been given to you, there is information about all the injured people from the beginning to this moment. The journalists smuggled the footage through 15 Russian checkpoints by hiding it in a tampon. The videos show an incredible glimpse into humanity amidst the brutality of war. In one clip, Payeska encounters Ukrainian resistance fighters who have captured a group of Russian soldiers. She manages to calm their aggression, even wrapping one prisoner of war in a blanket. Outside, she has a frank conversation with civilians standing nearby. They will not be as kind to us. Of course not. Will you treat these Russians? I cannot do otherwise. They are prisoners of war. Payevska's capture is one of hundreds of forced disappearances of Ukrainians since the war began. The Russian government has not officially acknowledged her capture, but Russian state-controlled network RTV posted a video on March 21st, which appears to show a captive Payevska calling for the end of hostilities. Russian media has attempted to portray Payevska as a member of the far-right Azov Battalion, but her fellow paramedics say that's not true. I cannot say that she's some kind of radical or Nazi, he says. She's like a real medic, apolitical, and helps everyone who needs it. Despite two months with no contact from Tyra, her friends and family remain hopeful she will return. I believe she will return. We will do our best. Each of us will do everything to make sure they come back whole. The face of a Ukrainian hero providing the world a rare look at the face of war. And Cal Perry joins us now live from Kyiv tonight. Cal, that's, that's extraordinary video. I don't know if we've seen a story yet like this from this war. And, and Tyra has, has quite the following there in Ukraine, correct? Yeah, the entire country, Tom, is following this story and tracking her progress, hoping she'll be released. She was a hero before the war. The Maidan Revolution in 2014 here in Kyiv is what made this country a fledgling democracy. She treated hundreds of protesters there, and she's saved hundreds of soldiers' lives since, Tom. Cal Perry reporting in tonight from Lviv in, or sorry, Kyiv in, in Ukraine. Thank you, Cal. Still ahead tonight, a getaway car straight from a movie script. Police arresting burglary suspects in California and then realizing their car had a device that could flip the license plate. You see that? On the go. Plus, the life-saving rescue in Florida the moment a sheriff's deputy pulled a nine-year-old boy from a burning home and saved his life. And a new way to curb drunk driving, the groundbreaking technology that could stop drivers before they make a dangerous decision. When you watch the story, you're going to ask yourself, why isn't this in every car? Stay with us. All right, back now with a getaway car fit for a James Bond film. Two burglary suspects in California caught with a car that, get this, can turn its license plate around and conceal it at the press of a button. Stephen Romo has the details. Now, pay attention, please. You've seen it in spy movies. Revolving number plates, naturally. But tonight, two California burglary suspects accused of vehicle break-ins had their very own undercover gear worthy of Sean Connery. I've never seen anything like that. It's very unique. Irvine police say this Mercedes has a device inside that flips the license plate over, covering the numbers so people and cameras can identify them. It's kind of like James Bond, right? You're, you're trying to disguise yourself so you flip the license plate over. It's not 007. Instead, Irvine police say it was a pair of accused car burglars. But their cover got blown by a key tip from a witness who lives in an apartment complex the burglars are accused of targeting twice. Condos and apartments make for easy targets because there's so many vehicles in one spot and they don't have to go from house to house. On surveillance video, he noticed the car would come in with license plates and leave without them. So when they started departing the property, I was already on the phone with Irvine PD dispatch. Police say they found and stopped the suspect's vehicle. Not only did they find the plate covering system, but an advanced device that siphons gas straight into their own vehicle's tank. Officers also report finding stolen items and evidence of identity theft. The suspects, Yasmin Kampoor and Chris Wen, are charged with vehicle burglary, vehicle theft, possession of stolen property, and possession of burglary tools. Both suspects pleaded not guilty to the charges and were released on bond before their trial. Efforts to reach them were unsuccessful. Thefts from motor vehicles in Irvine are actually down this year, but some thieves are clearly getting more creative. 
All right, and Stephen Romo joins us now live in studio. And Stephen, you were just telling me there's something ironic about all this and that device that we just saw there. Yeah, it's strange. California authorities say it is perfectly legal to have that device. It's just illegal to actually use it. So a bit of a strange so situation. So you can have the license plate flipper thing. You just can't use can't it. Okay, good to know. Stephen, thank you for that. We want to turn to a breakthrough tonight, technology that could save lives. Engineers are working to fight one of our nation's most prolific killers, drunk driving. More than 10,000 Americans die from drunk driving driving crashes every year, but the government and automakers are spending millions on this new technology to stop it. NBC News anchor Aaron Gilchrist has it. On the nation's roadways, an alarming trend. New federal data shows more than 11,000 people died in alcohol-related crashes in 2020, a 14% increase from the year before. Now, to help prevent those accidents, there's a new focus on groundbreaking technology that could soon become a standard feature in your next car. This is our opportunity today. It is what I call our, the seedbed of our generation. Engineers at KEA Technologies near Boston are developing an alcohol sensor to detect drunk drivers and disable their cars. So this is a door sensor, and then the steering column sensor is right here. The sensor is down here, and it's taking this, the sample from this location all the way down, and we calculate the alcohol concentration. Last fall, President Biden signed the bipartisan infrastructure bill, greenlighting a new law requiring car manufacturers to install anti-drunk driving tech in new cars by 2026. Rena Abbas-Taylor of Michigan worked with her local congressman and Mothers Against Drunk Driving to get the law passed. I could not talk about it. Um, and I did not know or care what came next. And it was this fight um, that gave us something to live for. Taylor's younger sister, her brother-in-law, and their three children went to Florida on a family vacation in 2019. On their drive home through Kentucky, they were hit head-on by a wrong-way driver. The family died in a fiery wreck on Interstate 75. The man in the other car died, too. His blood alcohol level was .306, nearly four times the legal limit. A loss like this, it doesn't just impact you. It alters you. I mean, indefinitely. Through their grief, Taylor and her husband have been vocal advocates for getting anti-drunk driving tech as soon as possible. What I hear is how many lives are going to have to be lost before we can say, all right, let's put this technology in. So when I hear three years, I hear 30,000 lives, and that's not okay. Back in the lab, Zauk's team is refining and running human subject trials and says it's on track to have sensors ready in two years. The goal was to develop sensors that can be non-invasive, unobtrusive, passive, if, if I get in and I, and I am over that limit, will the car not start? start? Will it start but not move? So What's our recommendation is start the car, don't move the car. Some groups like the ACLU worry this type of technology could be a privacy disaster, but the industry says that should not be a concern. There's nothing about what we are doing that would allow the technology to report you to a third party, to a law enforcement that will track you. The developers at KEA believe this tech could save thousands of lives each year, exactly what a loving big sister set out to do. What do you think your sister would say to you today? I would like to believe that Rima would say I expected nothing less from you. So, Tom, one of the big questions is about cost, right? Is this technology going to make cars a lot more expensive? The president of the Automotive Coalition we spoke to says no. He says once this is widely deployed in cars, it might add 200 bucks to the cost of actually manufacturing a car. Back to you. It would save so many lives. All right, Aaron, we thank you for that. When we come back, a potential shakeup at SNL. Did you hear about this? The major stars that could be stepping away after this weekend's finale and the new confirmed project for Pete Davidson. That's next. All right, we are back now with Top Stories Newsfeed, and we start with a shootout, but it happened inside of a 7-Eleven in California, all caught on tape. New surveillance video shows the men arguing inside the store in Montebello before opening fire, the clerk and customers ducking for cover. You see that all happening there. Luckily, no one was injured here, 
Police are now searching for the gunman. And the dramatic rescue of a nine-year-old boy trapped inside of a burning home in Florida. This is incredible. Body cam footage shows two sheriff's deputies outside of Tampa breaking through a window as flames tore through the house. The deputies guiding the boy over with their flashlights, then pulling him to safety. The child is still in serious condition, but survived the fire. And a potential major shakeup in Studio 8H. Several media outlets reporting longtime cast members Pete Davidson, Kate McKinnon, A.D. Bryant, and Kyle Mooney are all expected to leave NBC Saturday Night Live after tomorrow's season finale. Davidson will stay in the NBC family for his next project with an upcoming comedy series on Peacock, loosely based on his life. Okay, we want to head now to Oklahoma, where the abortion debate is taking center stage. A new bill is now being seen as one of the most extreme in the country. NBC's Maura Barrett has more. Tonight, Oklahomans expecting the most restrictive anti-abortion law in the country as the state passed a bill Thursday banning abortions after, quote, fertilization, with few exceptions for rape, incest, or medical emergencies. The governor has promised to sign any anti-abortion legislation that reaches his desk. We want to outlaw abortion in the state of Oklahoma. The bill goes further than the Texas law that went into effect last year, but similarly includes a provision allowing citizens to sue anyone who, quote, knowingly engages in conduct that aids or abets the performance or inducement of an abortion. We really are concerned because we know that um, with the providers that are currently providing, that they have patients scheduled today and tomorrow. This is about interfering with the right to bodily autonomy. It joins two other restrictive anti-abortion laws already passed this year in the state. We were there during protests on the state house steps. Women should control our faith. Oklahoma has seen numerous bills this session that impacts abortion care. One banning the procedure after six weeks of pregnancy and another that makes it a felony to perform an abortion. Even though this legislation is in Oklahoma, it doesn't just affect that state. What, what are the broader implications? So the result will be patients driving hundreds of miles outside of their communities off the, uh, over multiple state lines to access what is purportedly a constitutional right um, that should be protected. Proponents of the anti-abortion legislation see this as a huge victory. This will not save just one life. This will save many, many lives. It's more complicated than just, say, overturn Roe v. Wade. I, I feel certain we all would like to see that happen. We do want to see uh, the genocide of unborn babies ended in America. Emboldened by the leaked majority opinion draft indicating the Supreme Court will likely overturn Roe v. Wade. That would make it virtually impossible to challenge a law like this. All coming 50 years after the right to an abortion was seemingly cemented by the historic ruling. The final decision from the high court could come in late June or early July. It's possible the justices' final votes will change. It is just the beginning. We're seeing a preview, frankly, of what will happen if Roe is ever weakened or overturned. The Oklahoma bill does make exceptions for cases of rape or incest, but only if the crime has been reported to law enforcement. And as we wait for the Supreme Court decision that could overturn the federal protection for abortion rights, an NBC News analysis found that 23 states would institute bans if the power is handed down to the states, 13 of them with trigger laws in effect. So we can safely assume that we will see more legislation like this. This, although, as new polling shows, a majority of Americans do not want to see Roe overturned. Tom. All right, Maura, we thank you for that. Coming up, the major cyber attack targeting Costa Rica's government, plus the earthquake rattling China will take you inside a classroom the moment the school was forced to evacuate. That's next. All right, we are back now with Top Stories Global Watch, and Costa Rica's president says the country is, quote, at war with hackers. President Rodrigo Chavez says the hackers have infiltrated 27 government institutions and caused a major disruption to their IT systems. The group Conti Ransomware Cartel, which is believed to be Russian, is now demanding $20 million in ransom payments. A 4.8 magnitude earthquake rattles southwestern China. Take a look at this surveillance video. It shows students ducking for cover under their desks as the quake hit. Moments later, the building was evacuated. So far, no reports of any injuries or significant damage. And President Biden kicking off his first diplomatic mission to Asia as president. Biden touching down in Seoul, South Korea for the first stop on his five-day trip. He visited a Samsung factory touting the company's investment in a new plant here in the U.S. He'll also travel to Japan where he's expected to unveil a new trade framework with countries in that region. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Have a great weekend.
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.